The Battle of Crystal Palace, as it became to be known, was my first taste of real life or death combat. Even though I wasn't physically inside my interceptor, my body was only a few hundred yards away, somewhere deep within the underground base that I was fighting to protect. If the aliens managed to breach our surface defenses and get inside, I would be killed along with Lex, the Admiral, and everyone else. I wasn't going to let that happen. I also wasn't going to wait around until Red Jive got his or her drone launched and then proceeded to seal all the glory. I cleared my throat. Tech? I said. Are you there? I expected to hear the default synthesized female voice respond, but my surprise, the system had also imported my customized Armada sound profile, so I heard the familiar bite from, sound bite from Flight of the Navigator instead. Compliance, my tax said, using its digitized version of Paul Rubin's faux computer voice. How may I assist you, Lieutenant Lightman? Engage autopilot, I said, tapping the screen of my tactical display. I dragged my finger across it indicating an S-shaped trajectory through the highest concentration of enemy fighters. Take me right through the middle of that mess. You fly, I'll shoot. Compliance! Now that I was in a real battle, my flight of the navigator sound profile seemed inappropriate and disturbing, so I switched back to the default female, which, fun fact, had been recorded by the actress Candace, Candace Bergen. Chaos terrain had spared no expense. With the autopilot engaged, I changed my controller configuration so that my throttle and flight stick now functioned as a dual joystick multi-axis firing controls uh, for the interceptor's omnidirectional laser turret. As I did so, the turret's three-dimensional targeting system activated, highlighting the ship, enemy ships around me in an ever-widening spiral of overlapping red targeting brackets. Hello, fish, I whispered, reciting an old incantation. Welcome to my barrel. Tack piloted my interceptor along the corkscrewing arc I'd laid out, plunging it directly into the enemy's chaotic midst. A swirling whirl of highlight targets appeared on my HUD overlay. I cranked up my music even louder, took a beat on one of the leaders, and opened fire. To my surprise, I managed to take out seven enemy ships in rapid succession with precise sustained bursts from my laser turret before any of them even had time to take evasive action. Then the other ships on my HUD broke from their attack formation and, set and scattered in all directions, all while firing back at me or at my, where my interceptor had been a millisecond earlier. Just as I'd planned, when my interceptor passed directly through the center of the enemy's symmetrical gauntlet, their ships were caught in their own cross crossfire for two or three glorious seconds, resulting in the destruction of at least a dozen or more of their fighters. Then, as if controlled by some hive mind, they all ceased their friendly fire in unison, allowing my drone to escape and slip out the other side. I'd executed this maneuver hundreds of times and simulated Armada dogfights, and if I got the timing just right, it would always work like a charm, because the enemy ships reacted to it the same way every single time, the way video game enemies often tend to. But why would the same tactics work now in the real world if these were real alien attack drones under the control of sen sentient beings living in the subsurface oceans of Europa, half a billion kilometers away, why would they fly and fight exactly like their video game counterparts? How could Chaos Terrain have been able to simulate the enemy's maneuvers and tactics with such a high level of precision and accuracy? That shouldn't be possible, unless the European drones were being controlled by some form of artificial intelligence or some kind of linked hive mind instead of being piloted by individual sentient beings. My interceptor took a glancing hit to its shield and a warning klaxon sounded, drawing all of my attention back to the battle. The haptic feedback system in my chair vibrated to simulate the impact of the enemy plasma bolt against my shields, and I watched their strength indicator bar decrease by half. I highlighted another course on my tactical display and tapped the commit icon. Affirmative. The tack said calmly as the computer pulled us into a steep climb. On my HUD, I saw a long chain of enemy glaives converged on my tail and arc upward to follow me. My laser turret had already drained most of my power core reserve, so I switched back to my sun guns, then swung my targeting reticle over the leader, taking for careful aim. I closed one eye and took a breath, held it, then fired, and fired again, and again. Boom! Kaboom! Boom! 
Three more glaives exploded brilliantly in front of me, one after the other, just as I'd seen on their video game counterparts do. Just, I, just as I'd seen their video game counterparts do countless times before from the safety of my suburban bedroom, and I heard the words of a young Luke Skywalker echo in my mind. It'll be just like Beggar's Canyon back home. I nailed another glaive, and then another. I was on fire. Everything about the way these glaive fighters were moving and attacking was familiar, in some ways even predictable. And it still felt too easy. Like many fictional alien bad guys, the Sober Kai fighters I'd faced off against in Armada had always suffered from Stormtrooper storm Syndrome. They couldn't aim for shit, and they were always too easy to kill. But those had been fictional aliens in video games. These were real extraterrestrial ships in a real-life battle. So why did the same tactics still work? I mouthed the lyrics to the Queen's song playing on my headset and blasted another glaive right out of the sky. And another one gone, and another one gone, another one bites the dust. I took out three more glaives with a volley of plasma bolts, bringing my total kills up to 17. According to the mission timer on my head, my interceptor had only been in the sky for 73 seconds. Then, just as I was beginning to feel invincible, my ship took a series of direct hits from behind and my shields failed completely. Warning indicators began to flash on my HUD as TAC put my interceptor into an evasive barrel roll and we swooped in low over the base. The ground below was already littered with burning skeletal remains of hundreds of downed aethids. I zeroed in on one that was legless and decapitated, was still flailing and firing its guns blindly. Then its operator finally activated the, the drone self-destruct sequence and detonated, and the detonation caused one of the flaming buildings to, nearby to collapse. A rapid series of piercing shrieks each followed by what sounded like a brief thunderclap erupted from the surrounding speakers lining the walls, floor, and ceiling of my drone controller station. It was a sound I knew from... It was a sound I knew well from playing Armada. EDA surface-to-air cannons were being fired. During the game's online co-op missions, I'd learned to react to this sound by checking for friendly fire because the players relegated to operating surface guns during these battles were usually those with the worst aim. I tilted my ship's starboard and scanned the ground below, tracking the sound to its source. Several long, concealed trenches had opened in the terrain surrounding the farm on all sides. They were each lined with dozens of anti-aircraft plasma cannons and surface-to-air laser turrets. Each one of them was already moving and firing in its own unique pattern, and I knew these guns must now be under the control of the Earth Defense Alliance recruits like me, who were now also fighting for their lives from a darkened drone controller station somewhere deep underground. I reoriented my tactical display to a two-dimensional view, and it instantly reminded me of the classic arcade game Missile Command. Squadrons of glaive fighters were making repeated swooping attacks on the armored blast doors set into the surface, diving straight towards them in tight groups of four and five, raining plasma bombs as they came, while also trying to evade the steady barrage of fire from the base's surface cannons, with only marginal success. The number of enemy ships was already beginning to dwindle, and they were coming under more fire every second as an intermittent stream of reserve interceptor drones continued to emerge from the grain silo, launch tunnels, and join the fight. Infantry reserves were beginning to arrive too. New aethids and sentinels were pouring out of the underground bunkers in a steady stream, firing their weapons at the invaders as they came. My shields were coming back up now, so I deactivated the autopilot and nosed my interceptor over into a spiraling dive, attempting to engage another squadron of glaive, glaive fighters as they arched down to make another carpet bombing run on the already red-hot blast doors, which were now beginning to warp and buckle in their, immerse, in their massive earthen frame, creating gaps along the ed their edges that were growing wider every second. Soon they would be wide enough for a fighter to get inside, and that would be all it take. And that was all it would take. I adjusted my ship's angle of approach and closed in on the glaive squadron above, swinging my targeting reticle over their silhouettes on my HUD. I thumbed my weapons selector and armed my interceptor, interceptor's macross missile pod, 
Um, but just as I was about to fire, my target stopped firing it and accelerated their dive. For a split second, I was certain all five of them were going to crash into the blast, door blast doors in some sort of kamikaze run. But then I realized that they weren't going to impact on the doors. They were aiming for a spot several dozen yards away near the center of the farm, near a cluster of our remaining infantry drones, which were already scattering to get out of their way. But the squadron slid to an abrupt halt just before the impact and began to hover a few feet off the ground. In the space of a few seconds, the five glaive fighters turned and rotated themselves into, star -shape, into a star-shaped formation so that their wingtips barely touched, linking themselves together in a circular chain. Then the curved blade-like wings of the five glaive fighters began to interlock and merge with each other, rapidly combining, then reconfiguring to form a signal giant humanoid robot roughly the same size as one of our own sentinels, like a makeshift basilisk. The giant junkyard golem began to bound across the solitary paved road leading up to the isolated farmhouse facade, uprooting the line of utility poles adjacent to it, until the power line snapped across its chest like Godzilla. Tines of electricity briefly erupted across its shambling torso, but that didn't slow its progress. It kept on coming, as other glaives began to climb combine and make landfall behind it. That was when I stopped feeling cocky and started feeling afraid. Terrified, really. None of the Sobrakai ships had ever exhibited behavior like this in Armada or Terra Firma. This was something new. Nearby, squadrons of Aethids and Sentinels were already converging on the threat, scrambling to attack this new enemy in their midst. You've got to be kidding me, I heard a female voice shout over the open comlink channel. It was Lex. Since when did these things learn how to form into Voltron? She said something else after that, but her voice was drowned out by the chainsaw-like roar of her sentinel's gun, Gauss gun, as she unloaded both of them at the thing. Hearing Lex's voice seemed to remind me of all the other drone operators and that they had access to a comm link too, because the public channel was suddenly flooded with overlapping voices. Several of them were, grounding, were ground troops screaming for more air support. As the giant five glaive mech thing began to wade through their comparatively Lilliputian ranks, strafing them with plasma bombs from the proton cannons that bristled on each of its armored limbs. Blue flame roared from the thrusters at its feet and flexed, flexed its knees and leapt forward, propelling itself a hundred meters across the burning landscape toward the base's massive armored blast doors, which had both warped and buckled free of their frame, creating a huge gaps along their edge, several of which looked wide enough to allow the al giant alien mech to squeeze through and get inside. I scanned the wave of aphids and sentinels storming across the landscape below me. Each operator's call sign was superimposed over the drone they controlled on my head, but it took me several seconds to locate Lex. She was power leaping toward the newly assembled glaive mechs, but her drone and those around her were fighting through a hail of plasma fire from above as the remaining glaive squadrons swooped down in, swooped in to lay down cover fire for their comrades on the surface. I jinked my ship down and to the left, joining a line of interceptors beginning an attack run on the remaining mass of glaives. We rocketed straight into their midst, unloading everything we had at them. I nailed at least two enemy fighters myself and saw a dozen more get bullseyed by my comrades in the space of as many seconds. But we lost several of our interceptors in the charge. Down on the surface, I saw Lex's sentinel, sentinel overtake the lead glaive mech. The two towering opponents began to grapple with each other at the edge of the widest breach of the blast doors. The sentinel executed an impressive move, spanning uh, counterclockwise and bringing up one of its massive arms in a clothesline maneuver that knocked the enemy's mech leg completely off its hodgepodge torso. Lex power jumped her sentinel clear of it just before two of her other sentinels unloaded on the immobilized metal beast. This barrage was joined by hundreds of aphids who began to fire on it too. Within seconds, the, high, the five glaive mech exploded, raining wreckage and debris down onto the smoking glass doors, which ping, pinged and clanged as each impacted it. I swung my interceptor up and around again, intending to make another pass at the remaining glaives, but then I scanned my HUD and saw that only five glaive fighters remained, a small cluster of green triangles on my tactical display, um, moving into some kind of attack formation high above me. 
I angled my ship toward the remaining squadron, just in time to see them all simultaneously turn into a sharp dive, streaking straight down toward the base, as if they intended to make one final kamikaze run. But it looked to me like their angle was all wrong. They weren't diving toward the breach in the warped blast doors. Instead, they were descending... Um, they were descending toward the long row of interceptor launch tunnels nearby, the ones that had been disguised as grain silos until just a few minutes ago. Now, most of that false interior was burned and blasted away, leaving nothing but a scarred armor plating beneath. The diving line of blade fighters began to spread out, each one lining up with a different launch tunnel, and each of those tunnels, which I suddenly realized were all sitting wide open at their tops, led directly down into the drone reserve hangar. According to, um, according to the diagram on my HUD, that hangar was deep inside the base, not too far from where I was currently sitting. They intended to make a final kamikaze run into the base, through the open mouths of those drone launch tunnels. Science these, the simulated alien invaders in Armada had never tried this move. How had the rocket scientists who designed this base not seen this massive hole in their defenses? Luckily, I happened to be there to save the day. I jammed my, full, my, I jammed my throttle forward and moved in. I moved to swing in above them, firing my weapons before I was even within range. I got lucky and took two of them out. Then a few of the other interceptors loitering nearby finally began to fire on them too, taking out two more of the enemy ships just before they reach the open mouths of the launch tunnels. The last remaining glaive fighter managed to get through, and I continued to pursue it as it rocketed downward, closing in on the row of launch silos jutting up from the charred and blackened earth like a row of skeletal fingers. Attention all interceptor pilots, this is Palace Command. Admiral Vance's familiar voice barked over the comm link. Disengage and cease fire. Do not attempt to pursue that ship into the launch tunnels. I repeat, disengage and cease fire. We have automatic security fail-safes in place that will... I muted the Admiral's voice on my comm link. On my tactical display, I saw a wing of interceptors trailing me break off and disengage, just as Vance had instructed, and for a brief second, I almost did the same. The years I'd spent playing Armada had conditioned me to follow orders, and Vance's orders in particular, because the game's mechanics rewarded officer obedience. But that had been in a video game, and this was real life, and the Admiral's last-minute order for me to break off pursuit seemed to like certain suicide. If I didn't destroy this last remaining Glade fighter before it reached the other end of the launch tunnel, nothing would prevent it from overloading its power core inside the drone hangar. The, de the detonation could cause the entire underground complex to collapse in on itself, killing me and Lex and everyone else inside before any of us got our big chance to save the world. I wasn't willing to take that risk, or to trust my life to some moronically designed automatic security failsafe that had just allowed this massive enemy breach in our defensives. So I made the snap decision to disobey a direct order and commit, continued to pursue the kamikaze glaive as it made its nose dive down through the silo's open mouth and into the launch tunnel beyond it. Ignoring the insistent looping voice of Master Yoda in my, in my head, told you I have, regret this you will. We both streaked farther through the narrow launch tunnel, like one bullet chasing another down the barrel of a gun, both headed in the wrong direction. Just as I was about to open fire on the enemy ship, it turned into a barrel roll and began to scrape the blade edge of its right wing against the wall, and I pitched clockwise to dodge the shower of sparks it threw up in its wake. Once I righted myself, I managed to get the glaive back in my sights for a moment, and I shot a short burst at it with my sun guns, but they glanced off its shields, and it kept right on trucking. Meanwhile, overfiring my weapons had caused my drone to decelerate in speed, so the glaive had increased its lead, making it even more difficult for me to get a bead on it. It reminded me of playing Space Invaders. The last alien alive was always the bitch of the bunch, and the hardest to kill, because it moved faster than all the others. Was it just my imagination, or did this slave suddenly seem a whole lot harder to kill than all of its cannon fodder brethren? I had to stop firing for a second to focus on keeping my interceptor from crashing into the tunnel walls as I inched my speed back up, trying to get the enemy back at my sights. Its metal hull glinted up as the pulsing 
collision lights embedded in the concrete walls of the shaft streak past in a neon blur. The power in my interceptor was nearly depleted. Soon I would have to choose between firing and keeping up. I only had enough juice for a couple of gun sun gun shots. As our two ships continued to hurtle downward in a diving chase, I saw the tunnel begin to broaden slightly, and I fired another burst from my sun guns, but it didn't connect, and my cockiness now turned into panic, because the lone glaive had just cleared the tunnel and come into the other side, zooming in to the cavernous drone hangar. I followed it inside, then slammed onto my inertia interceptors inertia brakes, because it appeared that I now had my enemy cornered. I continued firing plasma bolts at the glaive, shooting it from a standstill drastically improved my aim. I scored two direct hits on its shield in rapid succession, causing them to fill, flicker and, and then fail. The second the glaive's shields drop, it slid to an instantaneous stop ahead of me, near the hangar's cavernous center. I'd seen the glaive fighters and EDA interceptors execute this maneuver countless times, while, the, while playing Armada. I'd executed it plenty of times myself. The drone had just initiated its self-destruct sequence. Its reactor core would overload in approximately seven seconds. I fired a last volley of plasma bolts at the unprotected enemy ship, which was already vibrating from the buildup of power in its reactor core. I held my breath as, it, as they streaked toward it, pray, silently pray, praying to Krom that they would eat, reach the glaive and destroy it before it finished transforming itself into a weapon of mass destruction. Time seemed to stop, and I caught a second long glimpse of the hangar around us and noticed that it was still over half full. Thousands of brand new, unused interceptors were nestled into belt-fed launch racks that lined the hangar's curved, reinforced concrete walls. I watched in slow motion as the shots I'd fired closed in on the quivering, on the glaive's quivering metal hull. They finally seemed to reach their mark at last and I saw a blinding white flash across my cockpit's wraparound screen, screens. Then they all went black and my entire drone controller station powered down, throwing the tiny room into total darkness. Somewhere above me, I heard the muffled atomic boom of a power core detonation, followed by a, a horrible rumbling that could only be several levels of the base collapsing in on each other. I don't know how long I sat there in pitch black darkness, listening to the aftermath of my mistake. At some point, the door of my controller station hissed open, and a terrible flood of light poured in, momentarily blinding me. As my eyesight slowly returned, I saw a female silhouette resolve in the doorway. Lex was standing there, with one hand cocked on her hip. Did you see what happened, she said? Some moron interceptor pilot chased that last glaive fighter into the launch tunnels right before the hangar went up. I nodded and got to my feet unsteadily, then I stepped out of my controller pod, feeling almost as if I had emerged from a real interceptor and a real battle, which of course I had. I'm still not sure what even happened up there, I lied. We'd already won, she said. We just destroyed all but one of their drones, but then somehow the last glaive fighter got inside the drone hangar before it self-destructed. Somebody screwed up. When I didn't respond, she studied my face for a moment. It was you, wasn't it? She said. Didn't you hear Admiral Vance screaming at you over the comm link? Everybody else sure did. She pursed her lips and gave me two thumbs up. Before I could begin to formulate my defense, my QCOM beeped and vibrated against my forearm. Then its display began fa flashing red to get my attention. A text message appeared ordering me to report to Admiral Vance in the command center. An interactive map at the base below appeared, and a green path lit up, leading from my current location in the drone controller hub into the outer corridor, then back, then down to another bank of elevators. Just as I finished reading the me message that synthesized female voice over the PA, spoke over the PA system, Lieutenant Zach Lightman, you are ordered to report to Admiral Vance in the command center on level three immediately. As Lex stepped aside to clear my path, she softly sang, you're in trouble.